a lot of the really savvy people that have been talking about AI for years, like Kevin Kelly, who uh, I've had on the show three times. He's the founding editor of Wired Magazine and brilliant technologist. Hmm. And he, he was saying, even as far back as the 90s, that trying to reproduce the human mind with AI is not interesting because we already have human minds. And that what's actually really interesting is finding uh, kinds of inference or kinds of intelligence that are meaningfully distinct from our own. That like we're like, you know, AI, we are making alien minds that can tell us something about us that we don't already know in the way that like learning to communicate with dolphins, for instance, is going to radically expand our our view of the world. And so like, again, like, you know, when it comes to SETI, there's like three stances. There's, you know, let's look out into space for life. There's let's look into our own phenomenal experience with psychedelics. And then there's this other thing, which is going on with groups like the Interspecies Internet, uh, interspecies.io, which is like co-founded by Vint Cerf and Peter Gabriel. It's a fascinating project. Um, what is it about? It's about using machine learning to create a translation layer between humans and non-humans. So like learning to communicate with dolphins and apes and, and corvids and other kinds of creature with, uh, with AI so that you have, you know, like the, the, like in up, you know, the dog's got the, the, the yeah. translation collar. Yeah. That stuff is like an inch away from us right now. Really? Um, I was going to have Karen Bacher on the show. Karen, uh, passed away last year tragically, but she was a, a, a brilliant eco acoustician. What is the name of this, uh, Interspecies.io, um, but yeah, Karen worked on the you know using machine learning. She wrote a book called The Sounds of Life about using machine learning to decode the communication of everything from like whales and turtles to coral. Whoa. It turns out like all kinds of life use sound to communicate that we didn't even realize until just a couple years ago. Um, and so yeah, there's this whole explosive field right now of uh, ecoacoustics empowered by by AI so that, you know, like within a very short time, we're going to be talking to all kinds of non-human animals. And then we have an ethical question about like whether we should, um, whether we, you know, whether it's, it's responsible for us to, in like, there are issues of like informed consent. Like, should we, should we really be giving, uh, should we really be like in the position to sell dolphins Instagram ads and stuff like that. That seems like a really bad idea because it's like they're like children. Like they don't like, sh you know, should you really let your kids just watch YouTube without parental supervision? No. And and anyway, so this is, you know, I, I just love the idea of like, oops, it turns out, that, you know, we thought that AI was going to be good for like missile guidance and stuff like this. The real feature of AI, the really interesting thing that it's going to turn out to be most useful for is helping us reconnect to this more sort of diverse relationship to mind and intelligence that makes our uh, our explorations of the cosmos inherently plural. I, like the last thing I think I had, I pulled up that I wanted to show you is this talk I gave a couple years ago about pluralism, and it gets it gets back to this this. Um, there's a ton of good links in here. Um, a six minute talk on on all of the different ways that people independently decided that pluralism was the correct basis for asking, you know, deep questions about reality. And so, yeah, so like, you know, the, again, you know, like there's an, an, there's a ton on the table uh, right now, like what we stand to learn if we do manage to kind of like reliably open discourse with different forms of non-human intelligence, be they terrestrial uh, organisms, be they machine intelligences, be they, you know, interdimensional ET type things or whatever. Mm. Um, every, every new, I mean, there's like, I guess like the way to, the way to put it is like the term alien has not always meant the same thing, right? Like there are people that call people crossing the border through Mexico aliens. Right. Alien just means beyond the horizon of my own sense of self, mm -hmm. right? It just, it's, it's, it's a, it's an adjective that we apply to the things that are exotic to our own understanding of yeah. the world. And so alien used to mean people living five miles away from you, mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe in another hundred years, alien will mean 
you know, something that currently lies so far beyond the scope of our comprehension, you know, we will not consider, uh, you know, the octopus to be an alien form of intelligence anymore, mm. you know, because we will be, we'll, we will have been brain linked to octopi through, you know, brain computer interfaces for a hundred years. So it'll seem like your neighbor, you know, in like the latent space of possible minds. That's crazy to think about. I mean, imagine, I mean, even if the, the work that the interspecies IO people are doing with using these models to decipher animal communication, I mean, imagine if th we were able to somehow link the minds of people from different parts of the world, like different countries. And like, like I just think, imagine how that would upset the balance of nations around the world. If it wasn't just like, if you don't just have like these people at the very top of the pyramid communicating with each other, and then the people below are just mm -hmm. sort of like, are just passive, right? If this thing becomes ubiquitous and people like you and me are able to tap into what people are thinking and communicate with, you know, people in other cultures that speak different fucking languages around the world. I wonder that how that would it ch change the global balance and like oh, yeah. how that would make, uh, when you think about, you know, superpowers and military might, like how that would make that obsolete maybe in a way, because we're know, in the middle of it. I yeah. mean, I, so 189 at Future Fossils, I interviewed Parag Khanna, who's uh, kind of a famous, a best-selling futurist author. Uh, I used to write for his blog at bigthink.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's spent a ton of time on this question. You know, this, this book that he and I discussed about a year ago, uh, or maybe two years Move. ago now. Move, yeah, The Forces Uprooting Us. He's talking about how... Uh, you know, the in increasingly interconnected global economy is dissolving national borders. And, you know, a lot of what we see as this sort of uh, counter force where people are like nationalism is having kind of a, a moment right now. But it's because uh, the actual larger historical trend is in the other direction. And, you know, I, 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 I am... Uh, uh, I'm not as unrepentant a globalist as Parag Khanna is because I also see the way that, um, you know, that the, as boundaries collapse, you know, things become more and more unstable and unpredictable. And it's yeah. not at all clear to me that we're moving into something that can be simply described as like a kind of global system, you know, like the internet, like everyone's pulling out of social media, um, because it's not safe anymore. Like the way that, uh, there was a UC Santa Barbara uh, study on fisheries, on mass capture fishing a few years ago, showing that as we've gotten better and better at, at net trawling large schools of fish, schools of fish have evolved to be smaller because they avoid the attention of these fisheries because they're swimming in smaller groups. They're mm -hmm. not, it's a, it's a diminishing re marginal return on, on fishing cost. And so something like that is happening right now in the surveillance economy where people are sick of being preyed upon in, you know, in these enormous herds of willing flesh online and are pulling out and like, you know, the, the new social media experience is one that's much more uh, like campfire scale than global scale. Mm. And so like as, as forces pull in other directions, right? Opposite yes. directions all the time. But the point that Parag was making was that um, as things have become more and more globalized, m voluntary military participation has dropped profoundly. That like people, like voluntary. young, young oh, yeah. people oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. no longer want to join the army because right. they no longer identify as national citizens on average as much as they used to. They no longer have a fealty to, you know, the, any a given country, they have, on, you know, on average, more of a fealty to being of a particular generation. Yes. And, or, you know, identifying as global citizens. My buddy Sam Barton, uh, who is a, a dear friend of mine, let's see, uh, what was that? Sam Barton, global citizen. He's working on a project, uh, Global Citizenship, Global Citizens United is 
a, a project he's working on with a few people to try and kind of advance this notion of global citizenship from the bottom up. Mm. And so, yeah, I mean, there are these, uh, you know, Parag talks about there being, uh, you know, that there, we have a moral imperative to open our borders more because, uh, you know, the, the demographic shifts in the population are making it so that we're going to run out of elder care, you know, like Japan is already struggling. Large parts of Europe are already struggling to, uh, with like replacement. And so people are running out of, uh, you know, options for domestic labor and for the care of the elderly and this kind of thing. And so we're going to have to, you know, like a society needs new blood in it. And right. if, if we're, if our reproductive rates continue to drop because of the, the systems dynamics of the demographic shift into urban living, mm. then we're going to have to replace that not with children from a given country, but from, you know, immigrant mo that's, movement. That's a good point that, uh, this guy, I was listening to a podcast with, uh, John Mearsheimer mm -hmm. and Lex Friedman had him on. It was a the guy's incredible. He was talking about this, that specifically in regards to immigration from Mexico and South America mm -hmm. and like how important it is like that. And also I think from like Asian countries that a, a huge chunk, I think more than ever of young people are that are currently reproducing the people that reproduce the most that are, are immigrants from those countries that are keeping our replenishing our population and keeping it from declining. And if it wasn't for all that immigration, our population would be plummeting like at a way larger rate. 